The summer of 2008 was a time of transition for Inter Milan, who, after years of falling short to arch rivals AC Milan and Juventus, had established an era of dominance in the top flight, helped by the Calciopoli scandal, a 2006 match fixing operation for which Juve was stripped of two titles and demoted to Serie B, while the Rossoneri faced a points deduction. Three consecutive Scudetti were not enough for club owner Massimo Moratti, who wanted more in the European department, and thus sacked Roberto Mancini after another early exit in the Champions League. The billionaire selected Jose Mourinho as the man to translate the domestic prowess to continental success. The Special One's UCL triumph with underdogs Porto and transformation of Chelsea into the Premier League's unbreachable back-to-back -back champions gave him the reputation of a winner, no matter the odds. His defensive tactics were undoubtedly inspired by the Catanaccio approach, born in Italy during the 20th century, and therefore the Portuguese coach was an ideal fit for the Serie A. Bringing with him a proven backroom staff and almost instant proficiency of the language, Mourinho was ready to impose his influence on the dressing room. Merely three major signings were made upon his arrival, Sully Montari for the midfield and two wingers, Roma's Mancini and Ricardo Caresma, the most expensive and exciting of the bunch. Mourinho's plan was to set up in the same 4-3-3 system used with his prior teams, deploying the new attacking acquisitions either side of Inter's number 9, Zlatan Ibrahimović, who was the side's top scorer in the league for two years running. The Swede was certainly their MVP at the time, capable of winning a match single-handedly, but the Italian champions were far from a one-man team. Led of course by the long-term skipper Javier Zanetti, El Tracto, the team had an unbreakable spine, featuring mature stalwarts such as the hard-working Esteban Cambiasso, versatile Ivan Cordoba, and Maicon, a complete modern fullback, Nerazzuros who could be relied on to play over 40 games a season. As ever with Mourinho, the starters were kept on their toes by some serious alternates waiting to snatch up their spot if the performance wasn't up to par. Adriano, Hernan Crespo and Julio Cruz were available to replace Slatan, and if Christian Kivu or Berdiso weren't pulling their weight on the back line, Marco Materazzi and Walter Samuel could bring their defensive wherewithal to tighten things up. This was the way Mourinho liked it. A strong basis of the old guard, with a sprinkle of promising younger talents who could bring a flair to their play. And so everything was in place as Jose's debut season got underway with the Supercoppa Italiana against Roma, the holders of the cup. In the late August fixture, a two-all tie sent it to spot kicks, which into one after 11 penalties to lift their fourth Supercoppa and get the debuting manager off to a perfect start. Domestically, Mourinho was able to maintain the form of the champions, beating Roma, Lazio, Napoli and Juve in the first half of the campaign to top the table. Zlatan continued as the standout, regularly appearing on the score sheet in what would be his finest year yet. But also, there was room for others to shine under Jose. 36-year-old Luis Figo was given more game time than he had been allotted under Mancini, and Nubi Montari found his footing instantly becoming a fixture of the starting eleven, more than living up to his bargain transfer fee. Although the failure of the 4-3-3 led to Caresma's loan out to Chelsea in the winter, so instead the manager reverted to Mancini's more centralised 4-3-1-2, opting for a striking pair with the support of an attacking midfielder. Initially, Adriano was slotted in beside Zlatan, forming a fruitful partnership but prompted by UEFA's push on the big teams to include more homegrown names, teenage prospect Mario Balotelli was offered a bigger chance to prove himself, with 15 starts in the league, from which he tallied up 8 goals. At the head of the diamond, Mourinho deployed Dejan Stankovic, who now 30 lacked the ideal mobility of a number 10, but was still able to have a hand in over 10 goals across the year. By May, they had gone 10 points clear of Juventus and Milan, and made it four in a row. Yet this was the minimum requirement, and despite a couple of trophies, Mourinho's first season underwhelmed some Inter fans. 
Succumbing to the Champions League holders Manchester United in the first round of the knockouts, having only narrowly made it through a simple group, he had fallen into the same trap as Mancini. Pressure had mounted on Mourinho's shoulders by July 2009, and the fans were expecting some significant activity from their club in the transfer window. What came was shocking. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, emerging from a season in which he converted 29 goals, was announced to be leaving the club for the European champions Barcelona, in exchange for 46 million euros and a 28-year-old Samuel Eto'o. This wasn't overly encouraging news for the Nerazzurri, as the Swede was far from the problem, but the offer was too good to reject, and many more moves were to be made. Starting from the base, Bayern Munich's Lucio was brought in for merely 7.85 million euros to be the heart of Inter's back line, which the coach wanted to push forward by 20 metres, pressing their opposition higher. Pacey, commanding and at 31 experienced, he fit what Mourinho was trying to do. As did Thiago Motta, a prickly central midfielder in the prime of his career, who was defensive but good in possession also, costing Moratti only 4 million euros and a couple of superfluous younger players. The retirement of Figo created an opening for a new 10, and in came Wesley Schneider, a playmaker with a point to prove having found himself useless to Real Madrid after welcoming world record transfers Kaka and Cristiano Ronaldo. The three South American strikers followed Ibra through the exit door, thinning out the Nerazzurri's offensive options, and so the coach searched across the nation for a marksman to fill the void. Genoa had just enjoyed its best season in years, thanks to the efforts of the aforementioned Motta, and especially their ace centre forward Diego Melito, who bagged 24 Serie A goals to finish second only to Zlatan in the Capo Canonieri. With this, the Argentine couldn't go unnoticed, and Mourinho splashed almost 30 million euros on a proven target man who, at 29, was entering the back end of his career, but brought with him the assurance of goals. This rounded off a big window, in which Inter had spent tens of millions, adding 13 players to the squad, yet the business was clever, shedding their dead wood as add-ons in deals to acquire top-class talent for a fraction of their true value. The team wasn't in need of an overhaul, merely a refresh, and by the end of the window, this was the updated starting lineup: Julio Cesar in goal, Zanetti at left-back, a centre-half pairing of Walter Samuel and Lucio, Maicon patrolling down the right, Dejan Stankovic supported by Thiago Motta and next to Esteban Cambiasso in a midfield three, at the tip of the diamond sat Wesley Schneider, in behind the front-line pairing of Diego Melito and Samuel Eto'o. With both veteran leaders and youth prodigies on the bench, this was an Internazionale primed to compete across all fronts. Doubts about the new team's ability to gel were validated when the Nerazzurri were overrun by Lazio in the Supercoppa and dropped points in their Serie A opener as hosts to newly promoted Bari. Yet, by this point Schneider hadn't been confirmed, instead it was five days later that they greeted the Dutchman, 24 hours before they would play the Derby della Madonnina. Equipped now with a real Trecortista, something clicked as Inter demolished their city rivals 4-0. Goals from both the Genoese boys, a masterful Schneider performance and defensive resilience, this was the new beginning, and they were off to a roaring start. Off the bat, Melito and Eto made for a great duo, scoring seven times collectively inside the opening month of Serie A. This was only made possible by the man behind them, and Mourinho's focus on the number 10 as the centre of creativity continued to prove triumphant domestically, pulling the strings as they transitioned from defence to attack. A set-piece specialist also, he could get a goal himself, popping up with a 93rd minute winner to clutch all three points from Udinese in early October. However, away from the league, things seemed unchanged, if not worse. Three consecutive draws to Barca, Rubin Kazan and Dinamo Kiev in the group stage of the Champions League terrified Moratti, as the elusive dream of the Big Ears seemed further from their reach. Trailing 1-0 in Ukraine after the first 45 called for a serious half-time talk, 
which spurred Inter onto a dangerously late equaliser from the Argentine and scrappy winner from Schneider to keep hopes alive. At the new Camp, the Catalan holders dispatched them with relative ease, leaving a home match against the Russians, who were also on six points, to decide the qualifiers. The Cameroonian, who already had a pair of winner's medals, gave his new side the advantage inside half an hour to be followed up by Balotelli. They had marginally escaped from disaster, and the coach, now fully aware of his side's strengths and frailties, knew their success would depend upon his tactical choices as they went into the new year. Emotions were high in Serie A as Roma sat tightly on Inter's coattails throughout the winter, and after a two-month unbeaten run, Jose was sent off during a hectic Derby d'Italia in Turin that Juventus pillaged thanks to some controversial refereeing. This, as well as their 1-0 defeat to Sampdoria at the start of the campaign, led to heavy criticism of the Portuguese coach, for which he rallied against intellectual prostitution, claiming the media were conspiring against Inter. Nevertheless, the Nerazzurri were playing aggressive football and getting results, topping the table by January, having racked up over 35 league goals at an average rate of two a game. The first months of 2010 were bound to be challenging for Inter, as they were involved in all three cups with massive fixtures upcoming. Milan in late January, Juve four days later in the Coppa, and most importantly Chelsea in the UCL. Drawing his former employers, this encounter was laden with context, as the Blues were coached by Carlo Ancelotti, a long-term Rossonero who managed Milan to their two Champions League trophies in the noughties. Starting the tie at the San Siro, it took just 160 seconds for their leading scorer to make his mark. Solomon Kalou wrapped an equaliser around the Brazilian five minutes into the second half, but Cambiasso rescued their lead and eventually the win. The real test was always going to be the return leg at Stamford Bridge, where Chelsea had a near impeccable home record. Although with inside knowledge having managed the Blues, Mourinho set up his side to hold off the likes of Drogba and Lampard, but pounce on the counter. Ten minutes remained when Schneider curled a divine long ball into the path of Eto, who answered it assuredly. Hailed as one of the manager's career highlights, a clean sheet victory in West London put Inter through to the quarters for the first time in four years. Their focus on Europe had seemingly affected domestic performances. A crazy February game versus Sampdoria saw Samuel and Cordoba both harshly sent off inside 40 minutes, provoking a handcuffs gesture from Mourinho to continue the suggestion that Inter were being victimised by the officials. He was fined €40,000 and handed a three-game ban, a period in which they drew at home with Genoa and suffered a shock loss to Catania. Repeatedly dropping points to mediocre teams, they had given Roma the opportunity to close the gap and leapfrog them into first place by April. The relationship between Balotelli and Mourinho had never been easy, but was increasingly strained across this season, costing the young Italian game time. And when Goran Pandev was freed from his Lazio contract in the winter window, Mario's role was reduced to an infrequent sub. Perhaps less naturally gifted than the teen, the Macedonian was a much harder worker and more versatile forward, who Jose knew could be asked to play anywhere without fuss. The coach's trust was repaid, and Pandev's nine goal contributions since arriving in January earned him starts in both legs of the quarters facing CSKA Moscow. Again, the ace Argentine drilled an unstoppable effort into the corner for the home winner before, in Russia, Schneider punted a free kick, which again went unanswered by the hosts, making Mourinho the first manager in Champions League history to take three different teams to the semi-finals. Engaged in the tightest title race in years, Inter and Roma had met at the Olimpico in late March for a match that many believed would determine the champions. Ending 2-1 to Igilarossi. 
Inter had a behemoth of a challenge ahead of them, needing a perfect record from their lasting seven Serie A games, interspersed with a Coppa Italia match and a pair of European semi-finals against Barcelona. A 3-0 whitewash over Bologna got them off to a solid start, however a late equaliser in Florence cost the Nerazzurri two vital points, putting Ranieri's side level. Able to avenge their draw three days earlier, Inter left the Frankie with a 2-0 win across the cup semi-final legs, meaning they would go face-to-face -face with Roma in the finale. Juve were next, and wanting nothing more than to upset the party, the Bianconeri retreated into a defensive bunker of Fabio Cannavaro and Giorgio Chiellini, and almost needless to say, it was tough to breach. A quarter of an hour remained when Mykon unlocked their rivals with a moment of pure quality. Eto guaranteed the victory, achieving some peace of mind prior to engaging in their biggest challenge yet. Pep Guardiola's Blaugrana had just conquered every honour in their way, stacking up six trophies in one calendar year and starring the best player on the planet. Many believed Inter to be a cakewalk for them. See, in recent years, their failure in Europe led them to being labelled as underachievers with no bottle when the going gets tough, and Mourinho was appointed to shift this narrative. Here was a tie drenched in intrigue. It was the ultimate clash of styles, Pep's possession-based tiki-taka versus Mourinho's pragmatic defensive approach, who had already faced one another in the group stage, now knowing what to expect. There was added weight for Eto as well, who Pep had denied a central role in Messi's favour, causing their fallout, so the striker had something to prove. Fortune came their way early on. The eruption of an Icelandic volcano halted air travel, forcing the Catalans to endure a gruelling 14-hour coach journey to Milan for the first leg. This seemed, however, to have little effect on the holders as things got underway, with Pedro slotting in a 19th-minute opener and Guardiola's men dominating possession in the early stages. Inter remained cool-headed on the back foot, dogged in defence and threatening on the break. Spurred on by 83,000 onlookers, Schneider found himself unmarked in the box on the half-hour mark. Mourinho had set up a double marker on Messi and instructed the midfield to limit Xavi's time on the ball, killing Barca's fluency on the build-up. Struggling to get into the game, the Ballon d'Or winner was robbed of possession two minutes into the second 45 and the hosts countered, driving through with apparent ease, fizzing a pass into Melito's path, who ran the byline and teed up Maicon for a flick-up finish. The weariness of the Catalans began to show and the Nerazzurri were eager to capitalise. Trying to get out of their half, a superb challenge from Motta caught the back line off guard and still with players advanced, Melito nodded a third past Victor Valdez. To the surprise of all, they had shut down overrun and simply outplayed the best club side of its generation, yet they had to be even stronger at the new Camp. Almost 100,000 people awaited them in Catalonia, and as soon as the whistle blew, the pattern was set. Inter sitting deep with caution, while Barca kept the ball, trying to tiki-taka their way through the visitors. Motta and Cambiasso formed a defensive square with the centre-halves, continuing to put pressure on Barca's danger men and stop them from working their magic, legally or otherwise. Mourinho's scheme was working well until the 28th minute when the Brazilian number 8 raised his hand to Sergio Busquets, whose Oscar-worthy reaction convinced the referee that a straight red was appropriate. A man down. Inter's difficult task had become improbable, needing to hold off Messi and co for another 60 minutes, yet they remained resolute. The half came to an end goalless, and into the second period, almost all of Mourinho's nine outfield men stacked up in their final third as defenders, letting the possession stats tilt heavily in Barca's favour. 
Lucio and Samuel seemed increasingly comfortable dealing with Zlatan, Messi and Pedro, able to maintain their clean sheet as the clock ticked on. Six minutes were left when the home side finally broke the back line, with Xavi finding Gerard Piquet free in a one-on-one. -on -one. Now just one goal shy of the final, the Blaugrana could taste the win, and the substitute Bojan answered the prayers of the onlookers. But the celebrations were short-lived due to a handball in the build-up. When the final whistle came, there was a mixture of absolute fatigue and elation amongst the Italian camp, who for the first time in 38 years would play in the final of the European Cup. It had been a Mourinho masterclass across the two legs, dubbed the most beautiful defeat of my life and his iconic celebrations said it all as he gloated in the arena where he was still known as the Translator, a demeaning reference to his time as Robson's assistant in the 90s. There was a 24-day break until the final, a period in which Inter had plenty to do. Roma's defeat at home to Sampdoria meant the Scudetto was Mourinho's to lose, and taking all three points from their visit to the capital, they went two points clear. There were only a pair of fairly easy matches left to reclaim the title. However, ahead of them was the other cup final, and at their Olimpico, the contest with Roma was tight and a rather ugly watch as the two main competitors in Italy battled it out. Motta intercepted a poor pass from deep, freeing Il Principe to gallop his way in behind Roma's back line and tidily put them one up, as he had done so many times this season. Much like Barca, Ranieri's attackers were hopeless having gone behind, and Inter saw out the game to pick up their first silverware of the season, a sixth Coppa Italia. On enemy turf, they had asserted their dominance over Roma, however the Serie A title race was still on. Hosting Chievo, a 4-1 lead was almost overturned in the hairy second half, but they managed to maintain a single goal cushion by the final whistle. Mourinho and his men travelled to Tuscany for the Scudetto decider, facing the already relegated Siena. A win would guarantee the title, while anything less left it up to La Lupa, who trailed them by two points with one fixture to play. Fielding nine of his starting eleven, the Portuguese tactician wasn't taking any risks, but a quiet nil-nil half of football left Interistas sweating as Roma were already two ahead in their game. Once again though, 12 minutes into the second half, the skipper's inward run was followed up with a sly pass into the 22. As had been the case in the cup, Diego Melito had delivered the killing blow for the Serie A title race, as Inter Milan became Italian top flight champions for an 18th time. Irrespective of the winter slip-ups and constant pressure from the Romans, they had made it five in a row and achieved the domestic double. However, celebrations couldn't yet begin, as within a week they would have the chance to go down in the sport's history. On the 22nd of May 2010, in Madrid's Santiago Bernabeu, Inter faced off with German juggernaut Bayern Munich, who were under the management of Louis van Gaal. Mourinho's mentor from his spell at Barcelona. Christian Kivu remained in left-back and the captain filled in for the suspended Motta in central midfield, while in Bayern's camp the only notable absence was Franck Ribéry, who had seen red in their semi-final. The Bundesliga titleists were anticipating a reserved style from the Italians and this is what they got as the game's tempo was set. An expected defensive start from Inter played right into the Bavarian's hands, as the deadly Arjen Robin caused all sorts of problems down the right flank. Superior throughout the opening half hour, the likes of Van Bommel and Bastian Schweinsteiger were dictatorial in the centre, offering the Italians very little of the ball. Then, a pinpoint hoof from Cesar was headed down by Milito into Schneider, who threaded a 1-2 ahead of the sprinting Argentine.
Protecting a lead had become Inter's forte and so this was the perfect situation for them going into half-time. Moments after the restart, however, Thomas Müller should have levelled the scoreline, reminding the Nerazzurri to stay on their toes. Still Bayern's best player on the day, whenever Robben got on the ball, the Italians stopped breathing. Inter knew they had to widen the gap. On the stroke of the 70th minute, Schneider fumbled the ball into Eto, who crossed it to Melito, and the 22 ran at the retreating centre-halves. He faked a shot, cut inside and side-footed home his 30th of the campaign. Bayern were beaten. Ineffective on the offence and too vulnerable on the counter, Van Gaal couldn't overcome Mourinho's strategy. The student had become the master, and seconds before the final whistle, the embrace between the pair was of respectful admiration. Howard Webb called it, and a wave of black and blue euphoria flooded the Bernabeu as a 48-year-long wait came to an end. Two trophies had become three, as Internazionale made history as the first Italian club to ever achieve the treble and it's irrefutable to say that this was, and still is, the best season in the club's 102-year history. Amidst all the glee, there was a sombre feeling during the trophy presentation due to the reports linking Mourinho to the Real Madrid job, and while waving to the Interistas, it was clear that this was Jose's last goodbye. A famous post-match moment between he and Marco Materazzi who he had brought on in the last moments of the final, encapsulated how this exceptional feat was accomplished. Mourinho had formed an emotional attachment with his players. The transfers he organised all had a chip on their shoulder and he gave them the sense of purpose they were missing. Though tough and demanding, he could get under their skin in a way no manager could, and those who responded well kept their places in his regular team. Schneider stated he would kill and die for Mourinho, while Eto was prepared to change his role in a way that had cost Guardiola the Cameroonian services. The team loved him as he loved them, and they collectively created one of the mentally toughest club sides of the Champions League era.